and thank you, Robert, for inviting me. Uh, you know, the triangulation of this has to go through a framework which is, as we say, proportionate, meaning that we are really able to target uh, or to introduce some obligations for those applications that are actually risky. You know, we have, we speak about AI, you have a very interesting report covering seven sectors and the economic gains of AI come from the fact that it applies to all the sectors of the economy from agriculture to the financial sector to healthcare. But in reality, not all the artificial intelligence applications have problems of trust, only some of them. And normally they have problems of trust because they uh, create concerns in terms of our uh, safety or in terms of the violation of fundamental rights. And you know, when we had a public consultation for our white paper, uh, most people declared that they were very concerned about fundamental rights and in particular, they were very concerned about discrimination. So these are the elements that we, let's say, have to put under control. And, uh, um, and only in those cases where the, these elements are relevant, they're not relevant for all the applications of artificial intelligence. They're not relevant every time we apply it in industrial settings. So um, the, the, the way of, of creating a proportional framework is to be able to target all those applications that we consider to be high risk from the point of view of safety and from the point of view of fundamental rights. The most complicated um, objective that we have is to be able to identify when, for example, fundamental rights are violated. So we have to put in place mechanisms. We are not putting in place new rules in the sense of new principles. We have those principles. They are our fundamental rights and they may include safety. Um, what we need is a mechanism that makes sure that those principles are actually respected. And to do that, the idea, as I said, is to introduce obligations only for those applications that are actually high risk. Now, these obligations we would like to introduce are very much based on the seven key requirements that were developed by the high level group and that you're discussing today. We have called them requirements in the white paper and they concern the quality of the data sets, they concern the documentation and the transparency, the human oversight, uh, the robustness and the accuracy of the AI system. So they are very similar and actually very much based on the work of the high level group that we have very much appreciated. And I want to say it here also because Raja and Luciano were uh, members of this group. Um, and uh, um, they, the idea is to be able to transform these requirements if possible into clear implementation mechanisms and even standards that we can introduce so that companies and developers can easily uh, ensure an environment of uh, uh, transparency and more trustful, trustful environment in the European Union. Now, why is trust important? It's not only for the obvious reason that citizens want or the users of AI want to uh, be sure that uh, uh, they're not gonna be negatively affected by, by this. It's important also to ensure the uptake of AI. So AI is very important for our economy, for our societal well-being. This has been said before. We have to ensure its uptake. It's not so obvious. I'll give you an example. Recently, during the period of COVID, we have, through a, a project we have developed uh, um, in our research area, we have then decided to, to test these AI um, artificial intelligence that reads images through CT scans and is able to read if people are affected by COVID or not by a CT scan of the lungs. We have introduced it in a number of uh, European hospitals. And while the radiologists were really keen on using this technology, we saw the hospital administrations were quite reluctant. We could really see lack of trust in the technology because of the privacy of the personal data of the patients or simply because they didn't know if the system was actually going to perform or not. So there is a real need to introduce some clear rules if we want to foster the uptake of AI in the environment of trust. It's not the only thing we have to do. You mentioned earlier, we introduced the Data Governance Act a few days ago. That's also extremely important because of course availability of data is 
what feeds artificial intelligence. And we have, I think, paid attention both to the industrial data, which we believe is our strength, but also to the personal data by creating these new intermediaries and this new concept of altruism. I think in particular for healthcare, it will be really important. Um, and we work on the infrastructure of AI, uh, our activities in microelectronics, our activities on the cloud are all about creating a place where you can store AI safely, respecting privacy. Um, and also um, uh, AI is bringing big changes in infrastructure because it's bringing cloud close to the um, where, where the collection of data takes place. And so this phenomenon of edge computing is a, is a very important revolution in infrastructure and is very much driven by AI. Um, and just finally, also in education, I fully agree with what was said before, the importance of education and skills. We have created a number of masters in the European Union on AI, and we keep on pushing for multidisciplinarity and uh, teaching AI not only to computer, computing scientists and engineers, but also to doctors, lawyers, and all those who will have to work with AI systems. They will not have to program them, but they will have to understand how they work. So uh, we look forward to working with the parliament and to keep on working with experts around us. Uh, we will be creating a governance framework that will take everybody into account. And just one last point on the regulatory sandboxes that was highlighted below. Um, with the Digital Euro program, which is a new program, we are intending to finance testing experimentation facilities in AI. We will see how much budget we will have from that. But those are facilities that should help us in testing and also in creating regulatory sandboxes. And we are reflecting on this also for the regulatory framework. Thank you very much. Richard, that's very interesting. And I want to make the link between what you said about hospital managers and what Ravi said about local governments. In a way, um, in both cases, people are untrusting partly through a sense of lack of capacity. And if I link that to what you're saying about sandboxes, there may be, there may be this important piece about having centers of excellence and sources of knowledge so that as people trip over AI for the first time in their world, they know where in European society they can find a source of the capacity that enables them to trust. Because I think this, you know, the, the knowledge about new technologies is always unevenly distributed, but in this case, AI is deploying so fast that lack of knowledge can be an unintended bottleneck or an unintended source, as Ravi was underlining, of vulnerability. So I think that adaptive regulation, as, as you've underlined, as, as Dragos said, it's more than just the rules. It's also the infrastructure and the knowledge and knowing who to ask. So thank you very much. Uh, I'd like last to pass on this panel to Luciano Floridi, who was our master in the early days of AI for people and still at Oxford masters these things. Uh, Luciano, you have the floor and I, I, we consciously put you last in the panel to, to be not necessarily summing up.